We present Mr. John Rowe in The Life, Crimes and Death of Jonathan Wilde by Mr. Christopher Dennis, being the first of our cautionary histories from the Nougat calendar. I must assure my hearers at the outset that in compiling this, our Nougat calendar of crime, our malefactor's register, concerning the authentic lies, crimes, trials, dying speeches and executions of the most notorious violators of the laws of this country, who have suffered death and other exemplary punishments. In this, neither I nor my fellow editors are one whit inspired by any salacious fascination with the depravity and vice depicted in these deplorable histories, but seek only to offer a warning to unhardened youth. We begin with the life of a rogue who towers like a colossus above his evil kin, one Jonathan Wilde. Here was a man who, despite natural intelligence and early promise, became the foulest plague that ever infected any society. The year of our Lord, 1705, found this Jonathan in trade as an honest buckle maker in his native Wolverhampton, a small and unsophisticated market town in rural Staffordshire. And married to a respectable young woman who had already borne him a thriving baby son. He had, in fact, all that any honest artisan could desire or should expect. Jonathan, the baby. All right, all right. Yet contentment forms no part of a base, black-hearted nature. It's no good, Maggie. I mean, just look at it. I'm like a big fish in a little puddle here. I shall never amount to nothing in Wolverhampton. You see, my precious, but I can so much better make our fortune in the city, in London. I mean, if I'm to be a great man. A great man? Jonathan, you're a buckle maker. Then if Providence has no fitter furrow for me to plough than that a buckle maker, I must be the greatest of buckle makers. Buckle maker to the king himself. But I feel it in me bones as Providence has other fish for me to fry, Maggie. But, Jonathan, you know not a soul in London. Oh, and it's a fearful big place, as I hear tell. Don't you worry, none, me jockey. I shall shift for myself well enough. And indeed, he had the abilities to prosper. He might have risen to be master of the Honourable Guild of Bucklemakers. But evil will out. And within the hour of his arrival in the great heart of empire, he had plunged headlong into those pits of iniquity which abound in Convent Garden, and which were to become the anchorages of his spider web of vile corruption. I'll have the same again for myself, landlord, and whatever these three young ladies oh, is having. Oh, very nice. And so will I, too. What's well, you, blue skin? Uh, Shut up. What's that? If you can't pay, you don't drink. Yeah. Here, I shall be happy to stand the gentleman a glass if he'll allow me. Oh, blue skin will allow anybody when it comes to liquor. Then it's my pleasure. You've a deal of gout to flash about, my lad. What's it you do, then? Me, sweetheart? I'm a buckle maker. Oh, it's a buckle maker. <laughs> a dirty talk for now, eh? It's just a... I like a joke with the best of them, friend. But don't get above yourself or I'll throttle the life out of you with this one hand while I'm fondling this pretty lady with the other. And I shall think nothing at all about it. Now are you understanding me? <sighs> That's all right. <laughs> You can drink my liquor and we'll be muckers. Well, you know how to take care of yourself, darling. I've a job for a blade what can take care of itself. If I could be of service to a lady such as yourself, I should take a delight in it, ma'am. But uh, I've money in my pocket for a minute and too many sights to see to consider regular employment. But I was never in the metropolis before, do you know. Well, you mm. couldn't ask for a better guide than Mary Mullin, I mean. She'll show you sights and make your eyes water. She's a star attraction in some of them at all. <laughs> I don't quite follow. What is it that you do, sweetheart? Oh, anything the customers want, within reason. But most, I'm a posture woman. Posture woman? Whatever's that? Sort of an actress. I does these little shows, you see, for small but very select audiences. It's ever so artistic, mind, with a candle. And so he at once embarked upon a helter-skelter of depravity and debauchery with never a thought for his wife and child. Until... Hey, give me that, pray. 
You men straight in a deal of punishment, Jonathan. Put all your money on him and all. My credit's good. I can borrow some more. Or work, I suppose, if things get desperate. I don't like to see it when it gets to this stage. It's like being at a slaughterhouse for the blood. Yeah! Oh! Said he'd not go more than 30 rounds, but you wouldn't be told. Oh, he spattered all over me frock. Your name, Wilde? Jonathan Wilde. Who wants to know? The magistrate, Sunshine, and your creditors. I'm a constable representing under Marshal Itchin. It's Wood Street Compter for you, lad. It is surely a sad reflection upon a great nation that its prisons are no more than colleges of crime. Dark pits of depravity, where the unsegregated confinement of males and females leads to such scenes of lewdness as were not witnessed in Sodom, nor yet Gomorrah. Yeah, well, at the time, of course, I was upon the lodging lay. The lodging lay? Oh, I always a place to be a better class of thieving me, you see. I dresses myself up as a gent. A gent? You? Ha, 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 you can laugh over Dyer Lemon, but I can personate your ass to quark with the best of them. Oh, yeah, I see you at it and all. Talk about how I work scarecrow. Pay him no <laughs> heed, Jonathan, lad. It's only jealousy, cos I moves in higher Amelia than what he does. Oh. I puts on the poncy wig in that, you see, and talks all no blessed of bleeds and la dee da I takes a mate along, posing as me manservant, and rents myself a prime property for a year. A place where Dicky out of hand, gets the keys, calls up me other mates with a horse and cart. And we strips all that's saleable from out the property. <laughs> Furniture, hangings, fireplaces, <laughs> panelling, doors, pictures, carpets. Even took the fancy staircase out the last one I did. Sold a lot. But you'd have been a, a, a made man out of all that, surely. I mean, what are you doing here for debt? Oh, well, you never get the true value off the fences, you see. Lucky to get 10% of what the stuff might be worth on the proper market. Yeah, five would be nearer the truth. And then there's your labour costs. I mean, you've got to go in mob handed on a job like that. That's the problem for us sorts all down the line, Jonathan. Acquiring the merchandise is the easy part. That's right. It's turning it to cash where the trouble starts. And even though he gets paid so poor, we still risk hanging at the end. In this prison, too, he continued his association with the infamous Mary Mulliner, the most abandoned prostitute on the tower. Suffice it to say that he was an able, nay, a model pupil. And when his freedom was obtained, this would-be great man emerged into the London streets as a common prostitute's bully. And worse, upon a felonious charade known in the canting tongue as the Buttercan Twang. I tell you, it's easy as taking toffees off of children. You just stick with me, but a few yards behind, and watch me make a catch. I gets the cove in an alley, all panting sweet nothings with his britches round his ankles and thinking he's pointed to paradise. Then I gives a little hem to let you know I've located his valuables. Yes. You steps in behind and batters him on the head. We strips him of all he's got and we clean away for he wakes wondering where he is. <laughs> Not content with this vile practice, the inventive Wilde soon devised more subtle ways for taking larger sums from wayward but unsuspecting gentlemen. Ooh, <laughs> oh. Oh. Now then, madam, what say you to... Oh, 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 oh caught you, madam! What the devil's he send you, strumpet? Oh, help! Save me, my husband! Ah, uh, but you see, I, I was just... Oh, uh, yes, I can see what you was just doing. You rich gentlemen think you can come among us poor, honest folk and take us honour from us. Oh. You, Lothario, you. I'll teach you to rob an innocent wife of her virtue with your fine silk clothes and fancy manners. Help! Call a constable! Call a constable! Ah, uh, no, no, uh, no. Surely we don't want the law involved in this. And name your price, my dear man. What price can recompense a man for the loss of his wife's virtue? Fifty guineas. You vile blackguard! Oh, Seventy-five! Rogue, rubbish, and evil sin to you, sir! A hundred! Well, oh. I'll grant I was being a little hasty. By these iniquitous practices, they soon obtained a sum of money which enabled them to open a low tavern in Cock Alley facing Cripplegate Church. This was soon the haunt of every thief and harlot in that neighbourhood of thieves and harlots. It is said that they held him in a kind of awe, for they were conscious that their lives were continually in his power as he eavesdropped on their every word. Here, what sort is you chucking on the fire, Blueskin? Well, it's nothing but a poxy diary or some such rubbish. 
One of them little notebooks the gentry carries. Not even big enough to make a blaze. Here, fetch it off and let's have a look at it. Who are you, sissy? Give it here a minute. Now then. Dined at Mrs. Mariner's, then on to Mother Clapp's for a tasty dessert. Blimey, he can read and all. My partner's a very intelligent man. Borrowed of Mr. Vincent £2,000. He'll be a great man one day. Listen, any other of these as you get, fetch them to me. And the same goes for business dealings books, as you might come across in warehouses and such like. But what use are they, Jonathan? I've a feeling this little book will be of more profit to me than all your wigs and hats and swords, and no risk to myself neither. Oh, yes. Well, and who the devil are you? My sure said you'd some business with me. That I have, sir. And to your interest and advantage, I'm sure. John! Coming, my dear. Well, spit it out, man. I haven't got a... Uh, you lost a little book, I think, sir, by way of being a journal. What? What do you know about it? Uh, of course, I've never been one for keeping that sort of account myself. I mean, uh, I'd not always want folks to be able to read what I've been up to. Especially not my lady wife. No! Or certain of my business acquaintances. Uh, this journal, you have it? Ah, uh, now, I didn't say that, sir. But I think I might come by it. Mind, I believe the party what's got it had thoughts of showing it to some other parties, parties close to your lordship, and he might need some inducement to part with it. No! Whatever it costs, you understand? Whatever it costs. Oh, well, in that case, I'm sure I can bring the matter to a satisfactory conclusion, sir. Yeah. No! Coming, my dear. No sooner was this sordid transaction concluded than he hit upon the infamous plan which made his fortune and at once set about putting it into practice. Now, my bloods, you know that as your trade goes at the present, you stand but a queer chance in life. For when you've made a good haul and took it to the fencing coals and flash pawnbrokers, they'll scarce tip you a pittance of what it's worth. Well, that, that, that's oh, yeah. fair enough, I suppose, Jonathan, for if they took with the stuff, they're hanged, just as if they'd sold it themselves. But you make such a poor living for your labours, and always at the hazard of being hanged. Which, from what I've seen of our dear departed muckers kicking and choking on the rope, is a precious, painful way of meeting your maker. Oh, yeah. Now, what's your idea, then, clever dick? Whenever you've stole anything of value, come straight to me with all the particulars. You what? You're going to be a fence, then? <laughs> not me. I'm not, Gwilt. I'm far too fond of breathing for that. I didn't say for you to fetch me the merchandise, just the particulars. I need to know what you took and who from and where and when. Then I'll undertake to return the goods to the coal what owes. Oh, uh, <laughs> what, what are we going to do, then? What are we going to do? We're going to knock on the door and offer to sell their goods back to them? You're not. You'd make a mess of it. But I am. I reckon there's nobody who'll pay a better price than him what lost the stuff. Yeah, you'd still be selling stolen property. Not at all. I should be putting the cull in touch with his property, assisting in its return for a just reward, a finder's for you might call it. I tell you, I'm going into the lost property business. Lost property. This euphemism for plain theft was the secret of his system and of his success. I happened to hear as you'd lost it, dear lady, and was upset about it, like. And then... It was a gift from my late husband. Oh, how much greater is the sentimental value of such a gift than the mere money what it costs? Oh, I would pay anything to have it returned. Well, now, ma'am, it just so happens that a pawnbroker acquaintance of mine had a similar article took to him the other day. Now... He's as straight as a die, and had a feeling it might have been obtained dishonestly. So he sent the parties concerned about their business. But when he told me of it, after I'd heard of your misfortune, well, it rung a bell, didn't it? Uh, and do you think you could recover it for me? I shall move heaven and earth in the attempt, ma'am. Oh, my dear Mr... Uh... Wild, ma'am. Jonathan Wilde, your humble servant. I, I shall see to it, Mr. Wilde, that you are well rewarded, of course. Service to others is its own reward, ma'am, as my dear mother always impressed upon me. Of course, there may be one or two unavoidable expenses. Not only was he at once so successful and so well rewarded as to be swiftly rich, but he saw further opportunity for the expansion of his business. First... His visits to the houses of the wealthy gave him valuable knowledge of what might be stolen. Secondly, 
he soon grew tired of making these visits to his clients and contrived to have them come as suitors to himself. Now then, Mary, and you, Obadiah, after this. Lost. A brown leather purse containing notes of hand for ten guineas. Also two silver finger rings, one set with an emerald and one with an agate. Also a black leather pocketbook edged with silver. All these were lost at the Fountain Tavern at about eight o'clock on Thursday last. Whatever's that, Jonathan? It's an advertisement for the newspaper. Isn't that fearful costly? What you might term a legitimate business expense, Obadiah. Every business has its expenses, which must be writ off against its income. Oh, it's all too clever for me. If any person will bring the aforementioned articles to Jonathan Wilde, Esquire, by Cripplegate Church, he shall have a reward for their return and no questions asked. There now. But Jonathan, you've put your own name and whereabouts to it. Well, I was brought up never to put me true name to nothing. In fact, I've used that many names in my time as I'm never total sure what my real name is. I shall always use my own name, Jonathan Wilde. That name shall be famous. How else can I be acknowledged? A great man. He took care that his thieves profited well from their first dealings with him and thus slipped a noose about their necks and bound them fast. <laughs> I hear as you made a good run of it upon Tuesday last quilt. Yeah, I've done all right, Jonathan. Done all right. But you know that. I'll fetch you all the details. Well, I have a feeling as you did and you didn't quilt, old mate. I mean, I know how absent-minded you could be. Are you sure you told me all you stole off that fat parson with the club foot? Oh, I, Jonathan. I told you all of that, all right. It's funny, then, as the reverend gent should mention when I went to see him about the return of the banknotes and the rings, how he should mention a, a screw pistol, silver-mounted and worth above a hundred pound. I, I, I can't say as I recall. Screw pistol? Screw pistol. You see, I'd be sorry if I was to get so confused as to let slip the name of the cove what done the robin in the first place. I mean, especially if his reverence might insist as I repeat that name in the hearing of a justice. I mean, I'd be embarrassed to take the £40 for hanging one of my old muckers. Screw pistol, you say? Screw pistol, silver mounted, worth £100. You know, now you mention it, <laughs> honest my head, talk about a survey. I've clean forgotten all about that, I <laughs> I thought you must have done. You just get it back from whoever you sold it to, and I'll see the Reverend tomorrow. It might be difficult, Jonathan. You'll sort it, Quilt, however difficult it is, or explain to sterner folk than me how you came by it. Oh, I will, Jonathan. You, you depend on me. I'll get it. I knew as you would. Oh, and Quilt, uh, while you're about it. Uh, yes, Jonathan. I think as Mr. Wilde might be a more fitting form of address from you to me in the future, don't you? Oh, uh, yes, Mr. Wilde. Of course, Mr. Wilde. And the rest of you within my hearing, remember, I need details of all, you thieves, for sure as eggs is laid by little chickens, the aggrieved parties remember what they've lost, even if you don't always remember what you took. Right, Mr. Wilde. Depend on it, Mr. Wilde. You know us, Mr. Wilde. Also, as from next week, I shall be working at a new address. I'm moving into the old Bailey. You'll know where I am by the sign. The Lost Property Office. The Lost Property Office. This place became a well-known landmark in the metropolis, and there Jonathan Wilde held court, while his clients came grovelling to him as supplicants for the return of what was rightly their own. At each stage they were bilked, from the payment of a crown to register for his services. Costs of administration, you know. Ooh, dreadful. To the final settlement, often in hundreds of pounds. And then there were the rewards, the gratuities. No, no, ma'am. If I have served you, then that is reward enough. No, but Mr. Wilde, I insist. He was now, to all outward show, a prosperous merchant. He dressed in silks, wore quantities of lace, sported a sword in a silver scabbard and drove out in his own carriage with his own pretty wife upon his arm. <laughs> The pretty wife, however, had a tendency to utterly alter her appearance from month to month. <laughs> and it was said of him that in the matter of matrimony, he worked upon the principle of a lending library. These poor girls, too, were brought into a menage where his second wife, Mary Mulliner, was a fixture, not only in his bed, but as his helpmate in hoarding what he had and accumulating more. Oh, it must be wonderful to read and write, then there are some with a single cross. Means I've got my eye on them. I've reason to suspect them of dishonest dealing. Then there are these others, do you see? With the two crosses. Mm -hmm. 
These are them that have not dealt straight with me. They're the ones I'm about to turn off to the gallows and collect the 40 pound for. Yes, that's what I call double-crossing. You're so clever, Jonathan. Never too proud to learn from those more experienced in vice than himself, he now attached himself to one who bore the rank and title of an officer of the law. Under Marshal Charles Hitchin was the sort of dissolute brute to whom our society too often entrusts its safety. You'll find me a most diligent pupil, sir. You need to be. Can't waste time. Paid hard cash for this post of under marshal, and I expect it to reward me, or what's the use of it? So you were not elected to the post then, sir? Of course I was elected to it. All was done proper. I was elected to it on account I'd been more for it than the other fellas did. If that's not electing, what is? Quite so, sir. Seven hundred pound it cost me. All Mrs. Itchin's late father left her. And I made it back in a twelve month. Well, that sounds like a good sound business you're in, Mr. <laughs> Under Marshal. I never realised being an officer of the law was that remunerative. Well, who'd be damn fool enough to do it if it weren't? I reckon to make me money both ends, from the criminals and from the justices. Ah, oh, now, it was the justices I was hoping to get acquainted with. Mr. Hitchin, sir? Uh, Mr. Hitchin? Do you like my new petticoat? Very fetching, Samson, very <laughs> fetching. Oh, my apprentice is quite took with it. Ain't you, Jonathan? Well, uh, Help are yourself, you... yourself, lad, to anything you fancy, or anybody, eh? It's all on the house for Charlie Hitchin. Oh, Charlie, you wicked man. Oh. Not been to see me for a week and more. <laughs> and who's your friend? But, well, these aren't women, are they? I mean, they're fellas dressed up. Takes all sorts, lad. All sorts. <laughs> I swear, I didn't know where to put myself, Mary. Oh, I can just see it. You in a Molly's house. Oh, it's proper took her back. I mean, there's nothing like that in Wolverhampton. Well, perhaps that'll stop you wasting your time and get you back to the business. It's all part of the business, Mary. You see, if we're to grow... Grow? Well, we can't grow no bigger. You're wrong there, Mary. The lost property office is but one block in the pyramid of my ambition. You worry me sometimes, Jonathan. You and Obadiah can look after the office day to day, and Roger Johnson will be captain of the ship. Ship? Yeah. Saw in the papers this morning. A ship? What do you know about ships? Well, not a thing. Never seen a ship in Wolverhampton, eh? But I shall learn, my sweetheart. I've that much stuff coming in all the time, do you see, as is too dangerous to return to the owners. So I shall set up a warehouse in Holland. I thought we could go in for a bit of smuggling and all. In so short a time, he had risen from prostitutes bullies to be the regulator of most of the crime taking place in the capital. He decided who should be robbed, he arranged the return of the goods and the rewards for that return, and he callously decided who should suffer for the crime. To crown all this, he was now to embark upon his most lucrative and most notorious career. Thief taker? Oh, Jonathan, what will folks say? Then what's the matter with thief takers? Well, there's such a low set of folk, Jonathan. Then I shall make the trade respectable and respected. I shall start by always dressing the part. Well, you always turned out smart. Smarter yet and more official looking with uh, gold frogging on me coat and a silver waistcoat and more gold yet of lace and plumes about me hat. And I know... I shall carry a staff, a staff of office, like a proper major domo or chamberlain of the court. I'll have it made special in silver, like a baton, a scepter. But still, a thief taker. I shall not be a thief taker, Mary. I shall be the thief taker. Nay, the thief taker general of Great Britain and Ireland. How does that sound? Oh, that sounds grand. It does. <laughs> and it suits you, Jonathan. <laughs> the title suits you. <laughs> and sure enough, this incorrigible rogue set about becoming a public figure. Wherever he went, he made sure the people noticed him. On the day of the Lord Mayor's procession, it was Jonathan who cut the most flamboyant figure. Even when the King drove through the streets to open Parliament, Jonathan Wilde, the thief-taker-general of Great Britain and Ireland, was as big an attraction as the monarch himself. And while respectable society sang his praises, many were the justices who were soon in his pay or under his control. I need him brought off, Mr Vaughan, for he's a spry young lad with years of good work in him. 
But he's guilty, Mr. Wilde. You're a man of the law, Mr. Vaughan, a justice. Now, what does the law know of guilt or innocence? Just fetch my man off like a fair-minded judge you are, and I'll see you don't lose by it. really, Mr. Wilde, what of my honour and integrity? We both has honour to consider, Mr. Vaughan, and poverty's the principal destroyer of honour. You just fetch my lad off, and I'll bring you three more to hang in exchange for him. You can't say I'm not public spirited, can you? One of these days, Wilde, you'll go too far. And what then, Mr. Vaughan? You'd not touch me, I'm sure. I mean, whatever would you do without me, eh? He now adopted the ridiculous affectation of holding his morning levee in the manner of King Louis XIV. This Jonathan would sit in his turban and nightgown, dispensing favours and reprimands to his parcel of cutthroats and highwaymen. And like all men who rise from the gutter, he began to despise his former state. Here we are. You sit along with me, Mary. Obadiah opposite. It. You there, fellow. Fetch us the bill of fare. Straight away, Mr. Wilde. Oh, I was never in a place this fancy before, Jonathan. Just keep your voice down, girl. Don't show me up. Oh, sorry, Jonathan. I come here quite often, of course, to meet my friends in the judiciary. Well, people will stare at me. They'll not dare while you're with me, girl. Evening, Mr. Wilde. Uh, good evening to you, Mr. Vaughan. Mr. Justice Vaughan, one of my men. See, I see the waiter. <laughs> oh, I say the waiter. Oh, it fetches another firkin of your best mate. This young lady's well nice sober. Oh, look, there's some folk we know. And Blueskin's one of them. What are they doing here? They come here to get away from Riff Raff. I thought it'd do us good to have a smart night out where the gentry go. Just off, Wild. No doubt see you later at the club. No doubt. And a good evening to you. The club? Justice! Oh, my Jonathan's so well known. Deal a difference between well-known and famous, though. What I need is more publicity, if I'm to be famous. Above being touched. But Jonathan, the newspapers are packed with your exploits. The highwaymen you catch, the gangs you break up. They report your comings and goings like you was royalty. They don't make enough of it, though. Don't capture the public imagination. What I need is... You know the sort of thing. There's usually children involved or defenceless old folk. If I were to hang the perpetrators of some crime what really shocked folks, then I'd be famous. Oh. <laughs> so I was listening to the fellow with the big nose. I says, would you mind giving my tea a stir with that while you're about it? I says, <laughs> who is that loud mouthed little squirt with blue skin? Only mind you blows it first. Oh, dear me, he's a proper little caution, he is. Young Jackie Shepherd. Known him since he was so high. He's not much bigger now. Too much cheek for my liking. Dad! He makes Are enough you? noise. For all he could yeah. walk under the table without stooping. Served his time as a carpenter, locksmith and all. He doesn't earn that sort of money he's splashing about from being a carpenter. No, well, I, I did hear as he started using his locksmithing skills for opening people's doors when they're asleep, or not at home, that is. Why have I not met him then? He's not been near me. I doubt he's nicked anything worth your notice. Everything's worth my notice. Tell him to come and see me Friday at my levee, Obadiah. Oh, not having dependents spoiling the trade. Right. Oh, I say, somebody, give me a hand with this young fellow here. Oh, whatever's happening? Oh, my mother. It's his sake. My mother. Yeah, he's covered in blood. Give me a hand. I say he'll bleed to death. Uh, constable. Call Dollar Constable. Mr. Wilde, sir. <laughs> Turning to me as a constable now, Mr. Vaughan. Well, I'll help all I can. You come here, young man, yes. and sit yourself oh. down. He'll bleed to death. Just... No, it's but oh. a scalp wound. Oh. You, waiter, get some water and a cloth. Straight away, Mr. Wilde. Oh, my mother. He killed my mother. Oh, indeed. <laughs> Out in the street. I must go. You just stay there, oh. lad. There's folk with your poor mother. There's nothing you can do for her, and your own wounds need tending. Now then, water, Mr. Wilde. You just hold still. Eh? There. Hold his head still, Mary, and tell us what occurred. We, returning from the theatre, suddenly a, a gang of men, there must have been a, a, a dozen of them, and knocked to the ground. One of them fired a pistol close by me in the dark. And I heard my mother scream and cry, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. The people coming. The, the, the rogues fled. I say, Wild, well, this must be the same gang that attacked Mr. Middlethwaite in Gray's Inn Road. Then I'd better set about catching them before they do any more mischief. I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that this is a national disgrace. 
that a decent and mature lady cannot walk home of a night from a pleasant evening at the playhouse with her son, but she is attacked and murdered. Yes. Yes. Oh, 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 but I swear to you that as my name is Jonathan Wilde, and just as I took the Whitehall gang, and as I single-handed captured Goodman, the highwayman, I shall not rest in my bed until I see these villains that shot and murdered Mrs... Uh, what's your name, young fella? Knapp. Mrs. Knapp? Dancing out their lives on the end of a rope. Oh! And I shall not be long about it, neither. And now he reached the apex of fame and public acclamation. In addition to the murder of Mrs. Knapp, which caused a public outcry, there were others to excite public sympathy. And seizing his moment, he more than fulfilled their expectations. Between the 23rd of July and the 4th of August, 1724, he tracked down and personally apprehended 21 of the gang who were responsible for both murders. London was at his feet. Mothers brought their children to be blessed by him. Handsome women fawned upon him. He was a great man at last. Not to all, however. Here, yeah, you! Was you addressing me, sir? I certainly weren't talking to none of these trollops you're tangling your limbs with. You a young shepherd, ain't you? I'm Jack Shepherd. Yeah. I sent instructions for you to come and see me. And what would you want with me, then? I hear is you're a bit of a dab handed breaking into houses. Well, now, I don't think I should comment on that. Though there's none better at breaking into a pretty woman. <laughs> don't strain your witty front of me, son. It doesn't make me laugh none. If you want to work for me, you'll have to learn to bend <laughs> your knee. Work for you? And why ever should I want to do that? In this city, lad, you either work for me or you don't work at all. No thanks, mate. Mate? I works alone. You don't seem to know who I am, lad. Oh, we all know you, Mr. Wilde. The blackest hearted, most hypocritical, cheating, double dealing villain in the town. And there, as you can see, I've other fish to fry. I wish you good night. Careful, Jack. No, look here, you. No! You look. I works where I chooses, Mr. Wilde. Oh. No thanks, mate. Mate? I works alone. You don't seem to know who I am, lad. Oh, we all know you, Mr. Wilde. The blackest hearted, most hypocritical, cheating, double dealing villain in the town. And there, as you can see, I've other fish to fry. I wish you good night. Careful, Jack. No, look here, you. No! You look. I works where I chooses, Mr. Wilde. And none shall tell me where I can go, nor what I can and can't do. From that moment, he determined to find a crime with which to hang young Shepherd at the next sessions. But in the meantime, he had other matters on his mind. A freeman of the city? You? A small reward, surely? Wild, if I brought this matter before the aldermen of the council, they'd laugh in my face. You'd better think it over, Mr Vaughan, or you and a few others might be laughing on the other sides of your faces. Are you threatening me, Wild? Reminding you, Mr Justice Vaughan, that we've had dealings together as are best kept from public attention. And any road, were it not for me, you justices would have damn all to do for your fat purses. You've a high enough opinion of yourself, Wild. I'll grant you that. I know my capabilities, and they're ones as you and your fellows have had cause to be grateful for. After all, what use is a judge with none before him to be judged, eh? <laughs> Wouldn't you look pretty damn foolish sat up there in your furs and finery if the dock before you were empty? And there's none but me has the guts to enter the den of a dozen armed ruffians, defy them to shoot me dead, and so terrify them as to drive them along like a flock of sheep to your lordships. You may rail against my methods, but you've only me to regulate the thieves of this city. Now, good day to you. But think well on what I've said. One of these days. It was a mysterious combination of chance events which toppled him at last. How vulnerable are we all to the blows of blind chance? Was not Aeschylus, the bard of ancient Greece, struck dead when an eagle dropping a tortoise from on high to break the creature's shell mistook the poet's bald head for a rock? So it was with Jonathan. Jonathan! Jonathan! Yeah, Jonathan! Guess what that young shepherd's been up to now? Getting yourself hanged, shot, cudgelled. No. Shame. 
Meant to do something about him. Been busy. Everybody's talking about it. He's a hero. <laughs> He's a lad and no mistake. And what's he done that folks should be paying him any attention? Well, that girl of his, Edgeworth Bess. Oh, uh, I know Edgeworth Bess well enough. Don't upon him, she does. Well, I only hope she doesn't sit on him at all. She flatten him. She was took up and shut in the roundhouse, see, over some scuffle she started in Convent Garden. Well, young Jackie marches down there like a little duke of bloom in Marlborough, breaks down the door, knocks over the beadle and carries her off in his arms. Well? Well, it may not impress you, Jonathan, but us women like that sort of thing. I mean, it's romantic, like in a play. Romantic? This romantic Jack Shepherd is getting on my bosoms. I'll have him when I've got a minute to spare. Wisdom would have counselled him to side with this new calf the public had set up to worship. Caution would have urged him to exercise restraint. Common sense would have told him above all not to hasten the fall of this new paragon, who would fall soon enough through his own foolishness. He's done it again! He's gone and flipping well done it again! Gone! Who's gone? Young Jack! He's in St Giles' roundhouse. Well, not anymore, he's not. Well, they only put him in there last night. Yeah, and he took himself out of there last night and all. Yeah. I tell you, it's like trying to keep a flea in a lobster pot. Young Jackie went straight out through the roof. Oh, <laughs> the roof! <laughs> oh, he's a lad. <laughs> oh, here. Jonathan's all busy just now giving the pickpockets their instructions for this garter installation at Windsor. Best not bother him about Jackie, eh? Well, what sort of nut do you think I am? I wouldn't dare. To Jonathan's delight, Jack Shepherd was recaptured in May and put into Newgate Prison, where he was placed into the strongest cell available. When his paramour, the so-called Edgeworth Bess, came to visit him, she was incarcerated with him in the same cell, even though they had no pretensions to being lawfully man and wife. However... He's not done it again. He flaming has. And Bess? It took her with him. No. True as I'm standing here. How? Well, blow me. If he didn't get some tools snuck into him by a mate, then he breaks right through that stone wall of his cell, three foot thick if it's an inch, drops him and Bess down in the exercise yard of the Clerkenwell Bridewell next door. Yeah, yeah, I know it. Then he climbs up the wall, which I'm here to tell you is 22 and a half feet, pulls that great sprawncy Bess up after him, drops them both down the other side, and away they walk. Arm in arm to the boozer, like any city gent and his missus are walking home from a night at the playhouse. I dares not think what Jonathan will say when he hears. What? I think he's heard. And now, with one badly bungled attempt at highway robbery, Shepherd became, in the imagination of the sensation-seeking public, a captain, a gentleman of the road. This newfound celebrity of his hated rival spurred Jonathan on all the harder to apprehend him. <coughs> No! No! Ah! Right, Jack Shepherd. There's two pistols pointed at your head. No, no, Mr. Wilde, I beg you, don't shoot me, let me live. Oh, gow, lad, I wish your admirers could see their flash, lad, now. Are those tears upon your pale little cheeks? There's a baby, our hero is underneath all the bragging. Please, no, let me live a little longer. Oh, I'll not kill you. You'll be worth forty pound on my books, so you may live to be made taller on the rope. Take him away! Ah! But all this time spent in the pursuit of Shepherd was time he should have given to the activities of his gang at Windsor. For here, the redoubtable Roger Johnson had infiltrated the castle itself, disguised as an ambassador, and had been dangerously successful. Well, oh, Jonathan, where have you been? Albert Dye's been going mad waiting for you. Jonathan! Oh, thank God you're here. Look, I've been frantic for one of you to tell us what to do. What's the score, then? They're blooming marvellous. Yeah. Roger alone got away with £3,000 worth. What? Oh, not a word of a lie. He, he was in there with the knobs. You know, he picked the Prince of Wales's pocket. That man's an artist. <laughs> There's one necklace alone worth 500 I swear. He got handed to him. He's an artist. Where is it? Oh, Roger's got it. We can't hang on to that sort of stuff. I must be seen to be finding it straight away. Oh, no, it's safe enough. He's took it with him. Took it with him where? To Ireland. Well, you gave him orders to sail as soon as possible. I didn't think before he'd given me the stuff. You weren't here. He thought it best to take it aboard and out of the country. Oh, I've got to get back to town. Round up the other lads, fetch them back with what small stuff they've got and get a messenger after Roger to fetch that lot back here. Lickety spit. They'll be hell to pay if I can't get that particular lost property back to its titled owners double quick. 
He returns to find the metropolis in the midst of great rejoicing. The streets filled with drunken, laughing crowds, stopping his carriage again and again. Get out of the way, can't you? Don't you know who I am? What's going on? Having a bonfire in the sea. I can see that, can't I? But why? Why do you think? I wouldn't say me be asking if I knew, would I? Is there nobody sober I can ask? Jack Shepherds. Hanged? No, they'll not hang our Jackie or Robin Blooming Hood. He's escaped again. Bob's <laughs> cut his way out of the condemned hole, disguised himself with a long cloak, and just walked out of the prison bold as brass. There's <laughs> not a prison built can hold our Jackie. Have how many times that blackguard Jonathan Wilde tries to put him away? Do you know who you're talking to, friend? No. Right! Then you won't know who smashed your face in, will you? I want everybody on this, Obadiah. He's made a fool of me too many times. He's gone to Northampton. Seems he's got friends or family there. What should we do? Send Quilt? No. I shall lead the gang what goes there personal. You lot collar blue skin Blake. He'll be in the stews for sure. And I want him took in my name as Shepherd's accomplice and brought to the justices. But Shepherd, who had no more intelligence than to stay about his old haunts, was captured on Finchley Common by the proper forces of law and order and returned to the condemned cell, where he was visited, feted and fawned upon by the cream of a society bereft of moral standards. His attempts at wit were taken down by Defoe and his portrait painted by Thornhill. Jonathan Wilde? I tell you, sir, there's not a more evil fella living, nor a more ugly mug in all the metrolopis, neither. <laughs> it's true, though, ladies, I've ours I'd sooner shake hands with a maggot in a dung heap if the maggot had a hand to shake and touch palms with such a one as Jonathan Wilde. Taking my name in vain, Jackie. Oh, Mr Wilde. Folks, pay to seek an audience with me these days. I trust you'll put your three shillings and sixpence in the app by the door there. Three shillings and sixpence? <laughs> oh, that come cheap, you know. I'd pay a deal more than three shillings and sixpence to see you secure in this place, Jackie. These manacles fast, are they? They put a deal of iron on you and no mistake. Three hundred pounds of it. But what are that? Cemented into the floor and all. I got out of this much before. But you'll not get out of it this time, will you, my cocky? We'll see. Won't we? No, you'll dance the hemp and hornpipe this time, lad, and I shall be there to wave you off, of course. I'll do better. I'll pay a fiddler to accompany your kicking. Still, can't stop. Only come for the gloat. Got to be diddling. I'm due at the old bailey to see your mate Blueskin condemned. Any message I can give him? Jonathan? Here. Three and sixpence, Obadiah, if you come into my presence. I'll no, pay on me way out. Here, Jonathan, it's Roger. He's back. Someone's been speaking out of turn. The ship. It was impounded by customs officers at Gravesend with a full cargo, if you know what, on board. What? Oh, dearie me. Trouble, Mr. Wilde. And Roger in the Gravesend, Nick. What? Oh, the worries that beset a great man, eh? <laughs> and the winds are jewels. The devil only knows. Get down there right away, Obadiah. Take one of the warrants I keep from Justice Vaughan. Say he's wanted for crimes here and fetch him to be at the Old Bailey. It was ever his joy and delight to attend the court and strut among the felons waiting to be condemned. At this time, and indeed until recently, only the judges of the Old Bailey had a roof over their heads and sat muffled against the weather at their high bench. The defendants, guilty and innocent alike, and the witnesses brought for or against them were herded in a sort of pit open to the sky. In this pit, Jonathan, tankard in hand, would move among them, dispensing favours, rehearsing false witnesses, and gloating over those he was about to hang. Good day to you, blue skin. Oh. You're looking a bit under the weather. But I reckon you'll look worse when you're choking, eh? Can't you... Jonathan, can't you do something? But what can I do, me old mucker? Oh, surely you could put in a word for me as well as for any other person. No, I believe you must die, blue skin. Oh. Even if I was disposed to plead for you. I never thought to see you fear to die. You, who was always so brash. It's not the hanging it, I fear. He said afterwards, I shall be carried to Surgeon's Hall to be cut up and anatomised. I'll tell you what I'll do, Blueskin, as it's you. Where anything? 
I'll provide you with a coffin and I'll send you some improving books while you're waiting. <laughs> I'll die daft. I forgot you can't read. But as to the surgeons, well, they're ever so short of bodies to cut off, I'm told. You double dyed villains! Hey, coffee! He's good at me! I'll hey, cut hey, your hey, flame and head on! Him off. Die, you swine! Oh, oh, die! 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 Set the knife! Hold him up! Hold him up! Keep him back! A surgeon! We need a surgeon. His head's near cut from his shoulders. But not severed, sir. I believe I shall live, though I shall rattle in my throat a while. Fetch me a surgeon. Tell him to get stitching, gentlemen. I shall not cry out over a neat piece of needlework. Most men would have expired, but built like a bull, Jonathan bore it all and having taken a bottle of brandy during the operation, was at last carried to a coach and taken home. How are you feeling, Jonathan? How do you think I'm flaming feeling? What a blueskin. Sentenced to death. Oh, what satisfaction is that to me? He not show regret. Oh, he's showing regret all right, Jonathan. Quilt? No, he is, though. I heard him. He's cussing all over his cell and swearing that if he'd murdered you, he'd have died with satisfaction. Quilt? And he's cussing a knife for being so blunt, saying he meant to cut off your head and throw it among the judges. Yeah, good, good news of Roger Johnson, though, Jonathan. He got away. And the jewels? Oh, they never got the jewels. But where are they? Well, Roger's got them hidden. But where's Roger? Ah, oh, uh, see what you mean. Get out and start looking for him. You too, Quilt. Oh, oh, Get everybody onto it. Them dukes and that isn't accustomed to being kept waiting. Folks is saying as I've lost my grip. As I'm past it. Oh, uh, uh, Jonathan. What is it? Jack Shepard. He's escaped again. Shepard had picked, filed and slipped himself out of 300 pounds weight of manacles and had broken through six iron-bound doors, all of them bolted on the other side. But in the ten days of this last freedom, he was never further than a mile from Newgate never drew a sober breath and was at last picked up unconscious with drink from the floor of Mr. Campbell's gin shop. There was no further escape. I wish I could have been there to see him hang. Better you should rest. Oh, you'd not have enjoyed it, Jonathan. He said some fearful, hurtful things about you. And how the people cheered him. Cheered him? He's only a rogue going to the gallows. No, no, Jonathan. He's their hero, do you see? There was riots when he was turned off and they had to bring in the military. Now, there's to be a play of his life on the stage with proper actors. A play of his life? A play of his life? That washed-out little weasel! <laughs> and what of me? Oh, you're in it, Jonathan. You've been writ in as the villain. Is Jonathan! It... What is it now? Oh, don't excite him any more, Obadiah. It's Roger, they've got him. Who got him? Where have they got him? It's Stratford. The constables have got him in a the nightmare. They're waiting for an escort to fetch him up to Newgate. Then we'd best be that escort. What? I want 20 men to war straight away. No, Jonathan, you stay I still. want them armed. Pistols, muskets, swords. I want a flaming army. Get them together while I get dressed. Help me, Murdy. Jonathan, you can't go. You're not well enough. <laughs> Shut your face, woman, and help me. Fetch me my sword. And now, indeed, he did go too far. At the head of an invading force of armed ruffians, he clattered into the sleepy hamlet of Stratford to the east of London attacked the constables in the performance of their duty and carried off a remanded felon. Before he could set about recovering the jewels, however, he was, to his great amazement, arrested. And the crowds who had but lately cheered him now turned upon the man who had so persecuted their hero and martyr, Jack Shepherd. Let us show the hair! Come on, out the way, you lot! Come on! Out the way! Let's have a look at him, constable. He don't look so grand now, do we? Now yeah, oh. then, villain, you shall know how it feels to be dragged before the judges with your life as forfeit. Liar! Thief! Treat him like Miley Devil! I wonder, good people, what it is you would say. I'm a poor, honest man. Honest? <laughs> I contributed more than any man living to bring the most notorious malefactors to justice. Yet now, by the malice of my enemies, you see, I am in custody and going before the magistrate, who I hope will do me justice. To ensure that conviction was the task which now exercised the city recorder and his justices. 
Drawing up charges was straightforward enough. One, the prisoner Wilde is charged with that for many years past he had been a confederate with highwaymen, pickpockets, housebreakers, shoplifters and other thieves. Two, that he had formed a corporation of thieves and that notwithstanding his pretended services in detecting offenders, he procured such only to be hanged as refused to share their booty with him. Three, that he had divided the town and the country into so many districts and appointed distinct gangs for each who regularly accounted with him for their robberies. And so on for 11 counts, all of them true, but not one on which these dubious justices dared to bring him into court. At last, he was brought into the dock, charged with the theft of 50 yards of lace. It seems likely that Mr. Bourne had secretly convinced Jonathan that the trial was for form's sake only. Gentlemen of the jury, I stand here before you, at your mercy, charged as a felon, a common malefactor, a thief. Yet is there a man among you who does not know me to be the most dedicated taker of thieves and malefactors? Do you not know me well, every man of you, as the proved and attested thief-taker general of Great Britain and Ireland? Have you not seen me about my work? And dangerous work it is, gentlemen. See here, if you will forgive me the indelicacy of removing my wig in a public place. See, these silver plates screwed into my skull. Yes, four of them, and each one to cover a gaping wound that might have been mortal in another man. And see here, the gash on my throat. Yes, gentlemen, I've never shirked my duty to the public to make our streets safe for decent people. And is it now to be believed, gentlemen, that I would spend my time, even if I had the time, in stealing a few yards of lace from the shop of an old woman? The jury brought in the inevitable verdict. Not guilty, my lord. I thank you, gentlemen. And now I must bid you good day and return to my work on behalf of the public. One moment. There is a further charge. And before any there, even the wily Jonathan, could gather their thoughts, witnesses were produced who swore against him for the receiving of stolen goods, the goods being the same lace which he had been acquitted of stealing. And before he or his counsel could draw breath, he was condemned to hang, hustled out of the court and taken to Newgate. It was said that the shock of it all unhinged his mind and that even in the condemned cell he refused to believe that he could be hanged. I mean, my services to the public. I'm a famous man, a great man. My fame? I've looked to the Lord Chancellor and the Earl of Southampton. I expect a royal pardon any day, you know. He declined to attend divine service, but asked of the ordinary. What does it mean, Mr. Perney, when it says, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. He went many days without food and thus grew weaker in his body and more rambling in his thoughts. What happens, Mr. Purney, after death? I mean, I never had no learning in these things. I've never spoken to a man of the cloth. This thing they talk of, the soul, is it in person form, like in life? Or is it a vapour merely, a vapour or a fume? At about two of the clock in the morning of the fatal day, he attempted to put an end to his life by drinking laudanum. But on account of the largeness of the dose and his having fasted, a violent sickness was caused. <coughs> After his stomach had discharged a greater part of the laudanum, he was still in a state of near insensibility. And in this state... He was put into the cart in only his nightgown and conveyed to Tyburn. Hooray! 
Never was there a greater crowd assembled on any occasion than to see this unhappy person. They huzzahed him along to the triple tree and showed a temper very uncommon on such a melancholy occasion, for they threw stones at him, with some of which his head was broken. It had been his practice, at the height of his fame, to ride in his finery at the head of the Tyburn procession, calling out, Some of my children are coming, good people! Some of my children are coming! So when he went himself to be hanged, a number of criminals ran before the cart, calling, Look out! Look out! Our father's coming! <laughs> Help! Help! Our father's coming! On his arrival at the gallows, he was somewhat recovered from the laudanum, and the hangman would have allowed him time to prepare his soul. But so outraged were the multitude at any indulgence shown to him that they threatened to hang the hangman himself if he presumed any longer to delay. <laughs> and so, in well-deserved ignominy, ended an ignominious life. Yet beware, for this Jonathan was not the only villain of his breed, as the other histories in our Newgate calendar will testify. In that same week that he received sentence of death for handling 50 yards of stolen lace, the Lord Chancellor of England, the Earl of Macclesfield, was found guilty by his peers of stealing from the public purse and taking bribes amounting to hundreds of thousands of pounds. In a world corrupt from top to bottom, a world where the chief minister of the crown makes use of an admiralty barge to bring his smuggled French brandy up the Thames, a world which breeds and tolerates a Jonathan Wilde, what care our young must exercise if they are not to be touched by the pitch of their fathers? As it was, not all rejoiced in Jonathan's demise. Crime flourished as before. Yet few were brought to justice. But sure, ere long, the time will come again when watches shall be lost in Drury Lane. Snuff boxes, finely painted, miss their way, and rings and pocketbooks shall go astray. Then you'll repent too late. You then in vain will wish to have your Jonathan again. In the life, crimes and death of Jonathan Wilde by Mr. Christopher Dennis. Jonathan Wilde was played by Mr. John Rowe. Mary Mulliner by Miss Sue Broomfield. And Obadiah Lemon by Mr. Cornelius Garrett. Blueskin Blake was Mr. Christian Rodska. Quilt Arnold, Mr. John Telfer. Justice Vaughan, Mr. Bill Wallace. And Jack Shepherd, Mr. Richard Pierce. Margaret Wilde was Miss Sonny Ormond. Mrs. St. John, Mrs. Judy Bennett and many other vocal parts were performed by Mr. Simon Carter. The music was especially composed and performed by Mr. John Telfer, accompanied on the violin by Mr. Don Leo Schlafer. The life, crimes and death of Jonathan Wilde, the first of our cautionary histories from the Nougat calendar, was narrated by Mr. Peter Jeffrey and directed at Pebble Mill by Mr. Sean McLaughlin.